Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. I was going to say it's good to see your smiling faces, but your smiles are covered. Ah, there we go. Richie, thank you for that. That was, that was noteworthy. We're glad to be here today, and uh, I'm thankful that although it's uh, quite dismal weather outside, it's blessed to be in the presence of the Lord and in the midst of his gathered people. So we're going to start this morning with a, a classic hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And um, this is written by Martin Luther. And not Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther, the reformist. And interestingly, and you may not have known this about him, but in this particular hymn, he wrote not only the very scriptural, very spiritual lyrics, but he also wrote the music score. So this is, this is a real hymn by uh, a man who was extremely talented and brilliant, as well as gifted in the things of God. And so let's uh, stand together and uh, sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God. that as the Lord of Sabbaths, 
And uh, that would be the Lord of the divine rest. But the Lord of Sabaoth is the Lord of armies, or many times it's called, or the word used is the Lord of hosts. And that's why it says, and he must win the battle. And I want you to know that today, if you're feeling even the least defeated, or if you're feeling that the battle is raging, the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts is there. He is our refuge and our strength. Our message today is going to be delivered by a very dear brother of mine. Um, most of you would know Dale Curdy. Uh, Dale has been a missionary in the land of Turkey. He currently is leading the ministry, the mission, if you will, to the students at Western Michigan University. Many of you know him from there, especially those of you that are watching this on the internet. So it'll be a familiar face. And uh, he's actually speaking about the kingdoms in conflict, life in a war zone. So uh, this morning we're going to be challenged in our heart and I'm looking forward to what our brother has to say to us. But as he prepares to come to the podium, let's ask God's blessing. Father in heaven, we are thankful that when we come to you, we come to a loving Father. We come to a gracious Savior. We come to the Lord God, the provider. The Lord, our refuge and our strength, our present help in time of trouble. We come to the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the one who defends us, the one who is a standard against the foe the one who by one little word shall fell them. And we pray that today as your word is spoken, that each of us will receive for our own quiver many arrows of truth that we might have to use as we live our lives in opposition to principalities and powers and the rulers of high places, those that are even above what we might reference to as the powers that be. And we do pray for the powers that be. We pray for our president and his cabinet. We pray for all those that are in authority. We pray for our governor. We pray for our local politicians and those that fill places of service to us as your people. And pray, our God, that they would rule, that they would understand that as they do so, they are doing so by your permission and by your ordination. For the powers that be are ordained. They are the order of God. So Lord, look down upon us in our need. Bless the situation that's come upon us in the regard of this virus. We pray, Father, for any of our members that are not well at this time. To our knowledge, we don't know of anyone that has COVID, but yet it is the cold and flu season. There are others that are struggling with other ailments and weaknesses, illnesses and injuries. We ask you, our God, to be with them and be a portion to them where they are. So bless us now as we are gathered together in Jesus' name. We pray, our Father, that we would acknowledge his presence, which he has promised to be with us. So we ask these things and give you glory and thanksgiving for all that you have done for us, but most of all, for so great a salvation that has preserved and saved a wretch like me and made us suitable to stand in your presence and give you glory within the veil. We bless your name and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Dale, Brother Dale Curdy, come on up. morning is kingdoms in conflict, life in a war zone. So what we're going to talk about is spiritual warfare. Uh, the last two times I, I've been here, we've talked about the kingdom of God. Um, we talked about the kingdom of God and what it is, when it is, and what it looks like when it comes. Uh, the most recent time, 
uh, I visited, we talked about entering the kingdom, and we looked at the story of Nicodemus and his interaction with Jesus and how a person must be born again if they are to enter the kingdom of God. And today, we're going to look at what happens when the kingdom of God clashes with the kingdom of the devil. So, I would just like to ask you um, to bow your heads and let's pray and just ask God's blessing one more time on the, the preaching of his word. So, please bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We are not entitled to anything from you. And Father, I just ask that you would um, pour out your spirit now, that you would speak to us through your word. I ask that you would invigorate our prayer lives, and I ask that we would um, understand the world around us, and that we would be zealous for the advancement of your kingdom. Uh, Father, let us be alert, vigilant, prayerful, May we live holy lives before you. God, I pray for your grace upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says this. We know that we are children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now, I want you to think about that. Do you feel the gravity of that sentence? The entire world is under the control of the evil one. Can I ask you, can I ask you a question, honestly? Do you believe that sentence, that the whole world is under the control of the evil one? Most people don't believe that. We live in a culture today that takes a a scientific kind of materialistic worldview. That means our culture tries to explain everything that is according to what can be seen. Most people believe that this world is controlled by economic forces or sociological forces or human leaders or political events and leaders. This verse tells us something different. It says that this world is controlled and directed by a demonic influence. It is controlled and directed by the evil one. Do you believe that sentence? Mm -hmm. Now, let's just talk about terminology for a second here. What is meant when it says the whole world? What is the definition of the world? Well, the world, cosmos, is the, the comprehensive system of values and beliefs and cultures and behaviors and structures that Satan has perverted and he now directs and instructs and uses for his purposes. So if you think about the world, you think about the people in the world and the cultures and the seething mass of humanity and all of its structures and beliefs and institutions, this verse tells us that Satan stands behind those and instructs them and directs them. His goal, the devil's goal, is to blind people to the truth, to conscript people into his service, to destroy the church, and to prevent the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, standing directly opposite this world system, we see the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, the kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? Let's review what we, we talked about a few weeks ago. The kingdom of God is the reign of God over human beings and over this world. The kingdom of God is the reign of God realized in this world and over human hearts. So that individual lives and our structures in society are both individually and in the community exactly as God would have them to be. The kingdom of God is essentially the answer to Jesus' prayer when he says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. I shared this. Now, here's the thing. This world is controlled and directed by the power of the evil one. But when Jesus came, Jesus brought with him the kingdom of God. He embodied the kingdom of God. 
kind of like an invading army would, would invade in a country. So Jesus, when he came into this world, he was invading enemy territory and bringing and instituting the kingdom of God over hearts and lives. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. The kingdom of God will be fully realized at some time in the future when Jesus returns. But right now, at the present time, the kingdom of God is breaking into this world, changing lives, it was doing so through Jesus and in the time of Jesus, and it is still doing so in our age. Mm -hmm. Take a look at this graphic. You can see the present age is defined by demonic oppression, hence the whole world is under the control of the evil one, enemy nations, injustice, warfare, sickness, spiritual darkness, death. These are the things that define our current age. And we see the Messianic age, the coming of Christ, defined by the reign of the Messiah, victory over enemies, justice, peace, wellness, the knowledge of God, eternal life. These are the things that Jesus brings. And we see the kingdom of God invading this world and pushing back, little by little, the kingdom of Satan. S simply put, 1 John 3 8 says this. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The kingdom is breaking into this world, bringing good news for the poor, freedom to those enslaved by sin, sight for those who are blinded by false belief systems, release for those oppressed by the devil, and good news uh, for Everyone who will listen. Jesus announced the day of the favor of God for all those who would listen. Mm -hmm. So this morning, now as Jesus brings these things, though, make one no mistake about it. The devil will fight with all of his power to hinder, pervert, stall, destroy um, the progress of the kingdom of God. And so what we live in is this time of battle. When the kingdom of God is breaking into our world, the kingdom of God is coming, but Satan is actively resisting the advancement of the kingdom. This is the era we live in. That's why we live in a war zone. So we're going to explore three questions this morning. Um, question number one, how, if the whole world lies under the power of the evil one, how does the devil control the world? We're going to look at what the scripture says. We're going to examine a number of different verses that tell us how Satan actually manages this world. Number two, how does Jesus address this conflict? And number three, how should we live in a world overrun with spiritual warfare? So those are our three questions. So let's go ahead. First question, how does Satan manage this world? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I thought God controlled the world. Uh, why does the Bible say that Satan controls the world? That's a good question. In Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, talking about the temptation of Jesus, um, Satan says this. It says in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Satan led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory. For it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. God has allowed Satan to exercise dominion over this world. But make no mistake, God is still sovereign. Mm -hmm. You know, recently I loaned, in the past I remember I loaned my car to a friend. Now the car still belonged to me. I could take it back whenever I want. But when I handed the keys over to my friend, he had authority over my vehicle to drive it where he wished and to do with it as he wished. In the same way, Satan holds the keys, in a sense, to this world. But when Jesus came in the world, he started the process of taking back what rightfully belongs to God. So how does he manage this world? Let's take a look. Esther. Chapter 3, verse 6. You remember the story of Esther and Mordecai and evil Haman? Okay? This is talking about Haman. And it says, 
Yet he, and having learned who Mordecai's people were, the Jewish people, he sco Haman scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Now, you remember the story. Um, Esther was the queen in Persia, and uh, Mordecai was her advisor. Haman was the enemy of the Jewish people, a high-ranking official who was persuading the king to kill all the Jewish people. Where do people like Haman come from? The first way the devil manages this world is he places people who are dedicated to his purposes into positions of authority and influence. Secondly, let's take a look at Mark chapter 4, verse 15. Jesus is telling the parable of the soil. And Jesus says this, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So in other words, Jesus is saying the gospel is preached, certain people hear the gospel, and then Satan will come and take that message right out of their hearts. The second way Satan manages this world is he blinds people to the gospel and prevents them from hearing and receiving it. Two weeks ago, I was on campus, and I met a young man, and we had a, we had a great spiritual conversation. And I remember we talked about the gospel, and I, he shared with me his phone number, and um, he expressed interest in meeting together and talking more about spiritual things and maybe getting involved in our student organization and perhaps studying the Bible. And I really felt that this conversation was a fruitful conversation. I had high hopes, thinking, I'm really going to be able to follow up with this young man. I texted him, no response. Texted him again, no response. Texted him again. He said, is this a fraternity? I said, no, and I reminded him who I was. No response. I saw him again last week. We were out doing an outreach on campus. I saw him coming towards me, and he ducked his head and pretended he didn't even know me. Now I'm wondering, what in the world happened? Now, what the devil does is he takes the gospel message and snatches it away from people's hearts mm -hmm. and minds. What else does the devil do? Take a look here in Acts chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. Paul, on his first missionary journey, uh, goes into a region, and he encounters uh, real resistance. Now take a look here in Acts chapter 13. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul, Saul is Paul, because he wanted to hear the word of God. So Paul comes to Cyprus, and he uh, starts preaching the gospel. The proconsul wants to hear the message, sends for Paul and Barnabas. But Elamas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. What we see here, what do we see? We see the devil working through this sorcerer, trying to pervert uh, and prevent the preaching of the gospel. The devil was actively resisting uh, the preaching of the gospel message. Related to that, uh, look at what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But what? Satan blocked our efforts. The devil hinders the missionary work of the church. What do you think is happening? Why, why is it so hard for, why do missionaries get kicked out of countries? Why do, they, why do they not get their visas renewed? Why, why do they get their luggage stolen? I mean, why do these things happen? Is that just a coincidence? Or is the devil actively working to prevent access to certain areas and to prevent missionary work from going forward? Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. 
The devil takes people captive to do his will through deception and through bondage to sin. A couple more. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. The God of this age, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What does Satan do? He blinds the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot receive or understand the gospel message. Luke 13, 16. Now, Jesus encounters a woman who was stooped over um, and in physical suffering. And look at what he says after he heals her. He says, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Now, Jesus encountered this woman who had a physical disability. Now, our response to that would have been like, well, we've got to get this woman in physical therapy. Maybe we need to go, you know, see a doctor. Jesus attributed this woman's physical disability to demonic bondage. Now, does that mean that all physical problems and disabilities are, are demonic-related? Of course not. But in this case, Jesus discerned that this woman's physical ailment was a demonic bondage, and he set the woman free. He saw a spiritual problem where we might be tempted only to see a physical one. Luke 22, 31. Jesus is, on the night of his um, betrayal, he, he speaks to Simon Peter, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. And we know what happened. Uh, Peter denied Jesus three times that very night. The devil harasses, tempts, accuses, and intimidates believers. Finally, our last verse, Revelation 2.10. Um, Jesus is speaking to the church in Smyrna, and he says, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution from, for ten days. He goes on to say, But be faithful even to the point of death. What does the devil do? He attacks, persecutes the church, and murders Christians. When I was serving overseas, we had a, a good friend who had uh, started a church in a certain part of the city, and the church was forced to close after about two years because it was repeatedly vandalized. Threats against it were repeatedly made. It was burned down, and the police not only looked the other way, but in, in a sense encouraged this kind of behavior. The devil is actively working to persecute the church. So in all of these ways, Satan exercises influence over this world. So, if this is the state of things, our second question is this. How then does Jesus address this conflict? So if you have your Bible... Um, I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to look at verses 22 through 30. Um, the verses will be on the screen, however, if you wish to follow along up here. So Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 through 30. So let's start, start first by reading 20 through, through 25. Matthew 12, 22 through 25. Then... They brought him, Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. And Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. So what's going on here? Um, Jesus um, 
had cast out a demon out of a man who was blind and mute. Now, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, had brought this man to Jesus. Now, it was not unique for Jesus to cast out demons. Uh, historical sources, such as the Jewish historian Josephus, explains that there were uh, Jewish exorcists who often uh, were sometimes effective. But Jesus was effective on an entirely different level. The Pharisees brought this man to Jesus, probably as a trap, because he was a particularly difficult case. And Jesus healed this man. With a word, Jesus delivered this man from bondage. Uh, now, the plan, now the Jewish leaders probably brought this man to Jesus because they saw him as a particularly difficult case, but this case backfired in that Jesus displayed his power and authority by healing this man. And in fact, the crowds were so amazed, look at what they said. They said, could this be the son of David? The term son of David meant was a reference to the Messiah. The deliverer that would burst forth into human history and bring this present age of suffering and slavery to an end and usher in the kingdom of God. The people thought that Jesus might be the Messiah. When they saw Jesus' power and authority, they thought he might be the Messiah, and this in, yeah, just infuriated the Pharisees. Now, what I see here, notice this. The Pharisees did not try to deny Jesus' power. What did they do? Instead, they resorted to slander. They, they were forced, actually, to, to logical absurdity. They claimed that Jesus was actually casting out demons, not by the power of God, but he was casting out demons by the power of the devil. They witnessed the power and authority of Jesus, and they attributed it not to the Holy Spirit, but to the devil. Now, Jesus answers this slanderous attack against his authority with three arguments. Verses 25 through 28, let's read. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Verses 25 and 26, Jesus answers by saying, Why would Satan fight against himself? He's smart enough to understand that his kingdom cannot stand if it exists in a state of civil war. Verse 27, Jesus, his second argument, his first argument is, Satan is not, can't be divided against himself. The second argument is this. You give your own exorcists, you, you give the Jewish exorcists the benefit of the doubt, and you assume rightly that they do their work by the power of God, but because of your prejudice, you don't give me that same benefit of the doubt. You approve your own exorcists, and you deny me. And yet we're doing the same things. You're inconsistent in your logic. For this reason, on the day of judgment, these Jewish exorcists who are casting out demons will testify against you in the sense that they will say, the Pharisees believed in us when we cast out demons, but they didn't believe in Jesus. And this testimony will be damning because it reveals a malicious prejudice against the work of Jesus and the power of Jesus. Verse 28, there is another option, though. The other option is not that Jesus casts out demons by the power of the devil. The other option is that the kingdom of God has come upon you. That the kingdom of God has broken into our world, embodied in me, Jesus says. And the kingdom of God is, has come upon you. Amen. Notice the worldview communicated here by Jesus. Okay, The world is held in bondage to Satan. This world constitutes Satan's kingdom. It is the realm over which he exercises authority. But Jesus says, my kingdom and my order, my lordship is breaking into this world and being established over hearts, communities, even nations. The kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, I find it interesting. In the book of Matthew, it reads, 
If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, verse 28. Now, the same story in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, the wording is a little bit different, and this is instructive for us. In Luke 11, verse 20, it says, um, If I drive out demons by the finger of God. Now, the wording in Luke is instructive to us because it tells us a little bit of the background of this passage and what it means. It refers us back to Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. Now, you remember that Moses uh, brought the Jewish nation out of Egypt, and in doing so, uh, God worked by sending plagues against the Egyptians. Each plague was a judgment, uh, an embarrassment, really, upon the gods of Egypt. Now, the magicians in Pharaoh's court, you remember, the magicians in Pharaoh's court resisted uh, Moses' uh, work and resisted Moses, these plagues. And actually, they were able to duplicate the first couple of plagues, at least on some kind of limited level. They weren't able to halt the plagues, mind you, but they were able to duplicate them on some limited level. And what it says, the text in Exodus says this repeatedly again and again, that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, hardened his own heart. And what the, what the Jewish exorcist says is that, that um, the magician said to Pharaoh after, after the plague of um, after the plague of gnats, which they couldn't with it, they couldn't stop, they couldn't duplicate. The magicians actually said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But then it says, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had said. So what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, the finger of God is upon you. The kingdom of God has come. I'm, if, I am performing miracles by the Spirit of God, by the very finger of God. Do not be like Pharaoh, who hardened his heart and resisted the work of God and ultimately was destroyed. Just as Pharaoh saw the evidence of God's miraculous power and hardened his heart, so Jesus is warning the Pharisees, you see with your own eyes the evidence of my authority and power. Do not harden your hearts. And do people today see the evidence of God's power and harden their hearts? Of course they do. So here's an important principle that we can draw from this passage. This cosmic clash of kingdoms that we're talking about this morning, this cosmic clash of kingdoms is played out in many arenas, but none of those arenas are more important than the human heart. The human heart is the battleground between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the evil one. Now in the following verses, Jesus talks about blasphemy against the spirit which will not be forgiven in this age or in the age to come. You know, there's not time for us to explore this passage in, in, in too much depth, in the depth that it deserves. But I'll simply say this. The essence of this sin is to do exactly what Pharaoh did when he saw the power of God and to do exactly what the Pharisees were doing when they saw the power of Jesus. They are denying and rejecting the obvious evidence and the powerful working of the Holy Spirit, and instead attributing the work of the Holy Spirit, the very finger of God, they are attributing that to the devil. This kind of blasphemy isn't a casual word that simply pops out of your mouth in a moment of weakness. This is a hard-hearted, Pharaoh-esque, resistance, fist-shaking, proud rebellion against the Spirit of God and the coming of his kingdom. In chapter 12, verses 34 and 35, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up with, uh, within him. Let's move on. Um, we're going to look at verse 29. Okay, now remember, Jesus has broken into this world He's bringing the kingdom. He's, he's leading an assault on enemy territory. 
Look at what he says in verse 29. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. What does this mean? Well, in this, in this example, Satan is the strong man, and his house is the world. Jesus binds the devil, and Jesus then plunders the devil's house. Jesus carries off the devil's possessions. What are the possessions that Jesus carries off? It's you. Mm. It's me. We are those who formerly belonged to the devil. And now we belong to Jesus. Mm. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Listen to this verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I would encourage you to memorize this verse and meditate on it. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Do you see what God does for his church? Do you see what God does for the Christian? He rescues us from the dominion of darkness and he transfers us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Now the kingdom is future, it's coming, but make no mistake, the transferring is done now in this present age. He transfers people from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of Jesus. Jesus enters the strong man's house, binds him, and carts off his possessions. That's why we're here. Because we are among those that have been redeemed from the house of the devil. Jesus has bound the strong man, and he has delivered us from his grip. Amen. Now there's a warning in the last verse that we're going to look at. The very last one here. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. In this cosmic battle between the assaulting kingdom of God and the defending kingdom of Satan, in this cosmic battle between kingdoms, you cannot remain neutral. Okay. There's, no, there's no middle ground. You are either under the authority and power of Satan, or you are under the authority and power of Jesus. You're either part of the devil's family, or you're part of God's family. You're a part of this world, you're a citizen of this world, or you're a citizen of the kingdom. There is no fence given to men upon which he may sit. Now let me ask a question. This, this, this passage raised a question for me when it, when it talked about how Jesus has bound the evil one. Has Satan already been bound? Some people say that he was bound during the temptation in the wilderness. Or at the cross, was Satan bound? Or is that binding something that happens in the future when Jesus comes back? Which is it? Um, my answer to that question is yes. Satan was defeated at the cross. And that's why Paul says, Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities, and he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Colossians 2.15. But, at the same time, in Revelation chapter 20, it says that Satan will be bound and cast into a bottomless pit. So in this present day, we live in the time between the times, so to speak. We live in the time between the decisive defeat of Satan at the cross and the final defeat of Satan at the return of Jesus. I hesitate to use this example um, because, our, because our election here, our presidential election, is still unresolved and it inflames a lot of emotions, but I think it's just such a good illustration. In November, we chose a president. We went to the polls, and as a nation, we chose a president. Uh, the former president was voted out, a new president was elected. Now, but that new president doesn't take office immediately. There is a transition period. And it is not until, uh, is it January or February, that there is 
inauguration day. So there is, there is a period of time between election day and inauguration day. And after election day, the former president continues on. Uh, but he's called, the word we use, he's called a lame duck president. Okay. And the new president hasn't officially taken office yet. He hasn't started his presidency yet. So he's called the president-elect. And so where are we right now? Well, we are between election day and inauguration day. Now that's a good metaphor. Whatever your political opinions are, I'm not trying to make a commentary on that, but it's a good metaphor for what's happened in this world. At the cross, Jesus disarmed and defeated Satan. But the final defeat of Satan awaits the return of Jesus. And so in a sense, Satan is the lame duck ruler of this world. And Jesus is the true and rightfully conquering king who will come and soon institute his authority and his power over all things. And so in a sense, we live in the time between the times. The time between uh, Jesus' uh, defeat of Satan and also his, and his final defeat of Satan. So how should we live? Our last question. We're going to move quickly through this. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, um, verses 10 through 20, um, Ephesians, let's, let's actually read this. Okay, Ephesians chapter 6. We're not going to look deeply into this passage and examine every, uh, everything here, but we're just going to make some general observations. Verses 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in his, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins about with the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall, be able, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray, listen to this verse. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Amen. That's our playbook. Amen. That tells us how we live in this current age. Verse 10, we depend on the power of God. We just sang that this morning. If we depend on ourselves, we are destined to fail. But we must humble ourselves and depend every day on the power of God for victory over temptation and for deliverance from the evil one. He is our victory, not our own self-discipline, our own righteousness. We must live lives of humble, vigilant holiness, putting on the full armor of God. We must walk in holiness before God, leaving no foothold for the devil. Verses, 10, or verses 14 and 16, we must exercise faith in the truth. Okay, con there are different truths for different situations, but we need to internalize the truth of God and be ready at every opportunity to, to call to mind the truth. That's how Jesus battled the devil in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. He had internalized the very truth of God and utilized that truth. But verse 18, oh, look at verse 18. I love this verse. It says, pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Always keep on praying for all the saints. Can I ask you a question? Do you do that? Do we do that? Do we pray for our missionaries? 
Do we pray for the church leaders here in our congregation? Do we pray for our brothers and sisters? Do we pray all the time with all different kinds of prayers? Do we always keep on praying for all the saints? Do we believe really that prayer matters in this battle? And finally, verse 15 and verse 19. Let me read verse 19 again. And pray for me that utterance may be given to me that I may make known, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Walk in humble holiness with God. Depend on his power. Appropriate the truth in your personal life. Pray all the time for all the saints. And finally, we need to share the gospel with the people around us. We don't, we, don't, we don't hide from the devil and think, oh, we're under siege by, by evil. No, we're actually the ones that are advancing forward and bringing the kingdom of God. We need to engage our culture with the gospel. I'll close with this silly little example. I remember being in high school, and um, I always enjoyed playing in high school the board game Risk. Does anybody know the game Risk? Have you played it before? Okay. Um, Risk is kind of like this world domination game where you build your army and you attack your, your friends and you, you kind of try and you know, take over the board. Um, you know, this, we played Risk all the time, me and my buddies. This is what happens when you don't have girlfriends. And so, um, uh, you know what the key to winning the game of Risk is? You attack. And you keep attacking and you keep taking territory. You have to be on the offensive and attacking all the time. This is how you win the game of risk. And honestly, this is our mandate as Christians, is that we need to take the gospel into this dark world, engage people with the gospel. This is the commission that Jesus has given us. Can I encourage you with those words to really reflect? Maybe Brother Dave will preach in more depth through Ephesians chapter 6. But can I encourage you, as you live life in a war zone, Let's be people of prayer. Let's be people of initiative. Let's be people who walk in humble, vigilant dependence on God. I'm going to go ahead and close us in prayer now. Lord Jesus, um, you have won for us the victory. I ask that we would walk in it now. I ask that you would give us courage. I ask that you would give us strength. I ask that you would give us opportunity. And we pray above all that by your hand and your power, by the very finger of God, we ask that your kingdom would come. We so dearly want, Lord Jesus, to see our friends, our neighbors, our community, our colleagues at work, our students at the university, we want so dearly to see lives changed, people set free. Um, we ask that your kingdom would come. We ask that you would fill us with the very spirit of Jesus and that you would give us uh, to see your kingdom coming in power, even as we await the day when you will roll back the sky like a scroll, and you will come back, Jesus. Exercise your authority over all the earth. May your kingdom come, may your will be done, on earth just as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. We're going to close with a song, and um, it's suitable for the message that we've just heard. Thank you so much for uh, being true to the Word of God this morning and encouraging our hearts. Onward, Christian soldiers, and we're going to sing the first and the second verse. The third verse is kind of interesting. It says, like a mighty army moves the church of God, and it, it has a line in it, uh, we are not divided, all one body we, and I thought, Boy, it'd be nice to be able to sing that in truth. But we're going to sing the first and the second verse of Onward, Christian Soldier. I think we should stand and maybe even uh, uh, take the, uh, the position of marching. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, by the way, it's, it's good to see all those that are involved in the ministry. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for our sister Grace at the keyboard and and all the rest of you who are involved in, in the ministry here. By, by the way, uh, did everybody get something from that message? Oh, yes. Okay, good. You know, strange, but I got something very little along with all the big points. 
But isn't it amazing that in the regard of those magicians who were considered very brilliant in their day, God used a gnat, a gnat, to open their eyes to his power. <laughs> and we find them to be somewhat of a nuisance, but uh, those magicians were inspired by an, a gnat to give glory to God and say, this is the hand of God. I hope that today you'll see something big. I hope you'll see something even small today that will point to the hand of God in your life and encourage you in this fight that we face as we live for him. Let's sing it together.